How did we lose? What's going on there? Oh, yeah. I got it. <clears throat> we have a, another seat here, and there's some a couple spots here in front that folks do want to sit. That's fine too. Yeah, because you're blocking my view. I'll take my toys and go home. I'm sure. Another one here. looks good to you. There's some seats up here in the front. You can't be shy. Take a seat or sit on the ground. All the way. I think. Oh, no. I think. Oh, Okay, I got a skinny thing. There's a chair right there, too. Okay. <laughs> you can move it. <laughs> <clears throat> Just kind of Is that everybody? Oh, no. Thank you. Thank you. Will you push the middle of that keypad? Yeah, just tap it once in the middle. Yep. Yeah. Uh, again. <laughs> there we go. All right. So I think we have everybody about situated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Is there anybody else out there, Amanda? I don't see anyone. And you might just check volume that you're talking on the computer, see if the folks online can hear. Can you guys hear me online? Yes, I can hear you just fine. Okay, great. <clears throat> All right. Well, welcome, guys. Welcome to Pipe Spring National Monument. Um, and thank you for coming today to listen to this short lecture about Missing Murdered Indigenous Women Day, which is today, May, May 5th. Um, so my name is Autumn. I um, you know, have worked here at Pipe Spring for about eight years. I started as an IIC intern in the interpretive division and then transitioned into a seasonal and then gained a permanent position in the administrative office um, where I currently work today. So before I get started, um, I wanted to introduce myself to you guys in Southern Paiute. So it's just a formality that us as Indigenous people do um, when we are public speaking or meeting new people, just so that we can recognize um, our lineage and where we come from. So my the Guven, Yuman, Nunu Mipian, Delfina Edmolihai, Sudutsing, Nunu Mikagu, Nola Zuniga, Sudutsing. And my great grandfather was Nober Zuniga, also from the Cedar Band of Paiutes. Um, so translation into English, what I said is, hello friends, my name is Autumn. Um, my mother was a member of the Cedar Band of Paiutes. The word at the end of her name that I used, um, Ichaik, means that she has passed away. Translated into English, basically, it's just identifying her spirit being in another, you know, in the spirit world, and I am here on this plane alive. And my grandma, Nola Zuniga, is also an enrolled member of the Cedar Band of Paiutes, and my grandfather, Nober Zuniga. So the Cedar Band of Paiutes is a part of the Paiute Indian tribe of Utah and is made up of five separate bands. So Today is a very important day within Native America. Um, you know, we recognize this day with great respect and solidarity with our Indigenous brothers and sisters and two-spirited people in our community um, that have been affected by this issue. So go ahead and change the slide, please. So what is Missing Murdered Indigenous Women Day? So for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, May 5th is recognized as the official day. May 5th today is the birthday of 21-year-old Hannah Harris, a Northern Cheyenne woman who went missing and was found murdered on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation in 2013. So it is today that marks her birthday um, and unfortunately the sadness that was bestowed upon her. Across the United States and Canada, Native women and girls are being taken or murdered at an unrelenting rate. Um, every day we have, you know, slew of women and men, um, and also people from our two-spirited community that represent the LBGTQ plus community that are going missing and murdered. Slide, please. 
So why does the MMIW movement exist? Well, the movement began to help draw attention. Many Native women go missing or are murdered each year, more than any other race. The movement has grown to advocate for other groups in Native America, which include men, children, and two-spirited community members. And many cases have been left cold for years, eons, and current cases consistently get ignored. So we have some statistics from 2018, about four out of five Native women have experienced violence. Um, so if there was five Native women here in this room, um, four of us would have experienced some type of trauma or violence within our life, whether it was in our childhood, our young adulthood, or even in our womanhood. Native women face murder rates 10 times the national average. That's a big number, considering how small our population um, makes up the United States, you know, collective of citizens. And the murder rate for Native women is about three times more than that of white women. So we are murdered three times more than any other person outside of our race. Slide, please. So how did the MMIW initiative begin? Um, you have some hashtags that you're going to see throughout the slideshow. Welcome to jot them down. Um, lots of them are social media handles that can get you involved and integrated in communities to help raise awareness. Um, and also for you to, you know, post images and whatnot. So one of them is hashtag invisible no more. And another is hashtag you are not forgotten. MMIW found itself as a movement first in Canada. So it was our Canadian brothers and sisters you know, up there that really started to recognize the issues that the women in their communities were facing. And as Native people, you know, we don't recognize borders. We don't recognize that border between North America and Canada. You know, we consider this all to be a part of what we refer to as Turtle Island and our home and our place that we were situated on by the creator. So the grassroots efforts to raise awareness found footing around 2015. And since this time, MMIW has grown and is gaining momentum. It is because of the efforts of Native women and their families, this crisis is gaining momentum. So, you know, it really became a matriarchal component that was invented or embedded in our contemporary culture. Um, women hold a very high power and status within Indigenous communities. You know, we are capable and able to give life. We take care of homes. We feed our family. And so we really started to drive this effort. And as efforts and awareness gain momentum, Native people in the U.S. also began to raise awareness and join forces with the Indigenous communities and organizations in Canada. Um, this is an issue that can no longer be silenced. Hence the has hashtag, hashtag invisible no more and you are not forgotten. So we refuse to remain to allow this issue to be silenced by any type of entity. We are speaking out and gain or raising that awareness. Slide please. Government and state support. Um, so here in Arizona, Governor Doug Ducey, or Ducey, excuse me, recently signed legislation to create a committee on the issue made up of law enforcement victims, families, tribal leaders, and more. And October 10, 2020, the Not Invisible Act of 2019 was signed into law as the first bill in history to be introduced and passed by four U.S. congressional members enrolled in their respective federally recognized tribes, which was led by Secretary Deb Holland during her time in Congress. And so today it is Secretary Holland um, that helps oversee the Secretary of Interior. So she is one of our Indigenous women that is pushing and you know, driving force in this issue. And just in 2021, President Biden released a proclamation on missing and murdered Indigenous persons awareness days. So you can go to the website for the White House. There is um, a short document that President Biden has placed on there informing the American citizens about how important it is to raise awareness about this issue. Slide, please. <clears throat> so labels of Native Americas uh, or Native, Native Americans propagate injustice. You know, one of the biggest issues that we face as Native American people are stereotypes and narratives that have con been constructed and imposed upon us. So stereotypical narrative for Native people. Um, you know, a lot of people, when we start to speak out about this issue and raise awareness, one of the things that is often said is they're lazy, they're drug addicts, they're alcoholics who rely on the government to survive. Why should we give these people any attention? It is these people's own fault because of their substance abuse issues of why they're being affected, why are they being murdered, why they're being human trafficked, you know, why they're going missing. 
And due to their involvement with addiction or addiction, like I stated, this is what they deserve. If you're going to place yourself in that type of lifestyle, then this is what you're going to get. It's often what people and families hear when they're trying to raise awareness about individuals in their family that are affected by this issue. Um, you know, as many of us know, substance abuse, if you've ever experienced a family member who has an issue with substance abuse, are completely, you know, understanding that, you know, substance abuse stems from somewhere else. And a lot of times in Native America, it comes from the genocidal trauma that was imposed upon us. You know, a lot of people tell us, well, the history is history. You need to forgive the past. But when the past is so much a part of your contemporary life and it is consistently imposed upon you, of course, it in integrates a feeling inside of you that is really hard to deal with. <clears throat> so modern stereotypes are created through acts of colonization and cultural assimilation. So European colonists with patriarchal views took the women as slaves to men, and soon Native women had been victims of rape, violence, and submission. Um, you know, a place that you can see this happening is here at Pipe Spring. If you really take the dive into the history, you will understand that when the Spanish slave trade system started here, the main targets were the women and the children. So they were hiring, you know, people to come here, pick off the women and kids and take them and sell them, move them into deeper Mexico and also moving, move them into California. So this creates a population deficit. And this is also where you get, you know, words like squaw <laughs> that get imposed upon indigenous women. Um, you know, that word use is never acceptable and it's actually, actually a derogatory term used towards native women in reference of our vagina and in reference of calling us prostitutes. Um, it was some of the French fur traders that first started using that word that is a part of the uh, Algonquin language. So native people being viewed as savages and soulless perpetuated mistreatment. This idea being introduced by the Spanish when entering the Southwest. When you read a lot of the Spanish documents and they're writing back, you know, to the old world and to the Spanish king, they're talking about seeing us living so freely and our bodies are so open and that we're soulless and we need to be prostatized. We need to be taught. We need to be given a religion because we don't understand creator or our own spirituality, which is completely inaccurate. Um, you know, indigenous people, we have a very strong and deep connection with our traditionalism and our spirituality. Um, but in reference to us being soulless is something that, you know, really has plagued us for a long, long time. And so if you've ever wondered, you know, what was the point with this big push of conversion of indigenous people? One of them was that concept that was imposed by the Spanish, that we didn't have souls and that we wouldn't gain one unless we learned Christianity. So this photo that you can see behind here, um, I wanted to share. This is out of landfill. And recently within the past year or so, I've started to see a lot of stuff coming up and reference to that these women or these individuals that are, you know, have gone murder or gone missing or gone murdered are trash and people are disposing of them in landfills. And so this is a photo of a fence around the landfill where family members and community members of this young woman have went and hung red dresses on the chain link fence, asking for the owners of the landfill to please open it up. We would like to sort through the, the garbage and the mess to find and see if there's any human remains in there related to these people that are missing. Slide, please. So sexual colonization of native peoples. Um, native people historically referred to as dirty, one quality being the lack of clothing worn by tribal people. You know, traditionally our Southern Paiute women, you know, if you would have came here maybe 200, 300 years ago, you would have seen our Southern Paiute women out there topless um, and with a cliff, uh, cliff rose bark skirt on, maybe have like a shell necklace or maybe some beads, but her breasts would have been exposed. You would have seen men in loincloths, so shirtless and with just a simple loincloth on in the warm months. Um, this is not because, you know, we were trying to over-sexualize ourselves. Within our community and in our tribes, you know, we are taught that the human body is just the human body. It's just as simple as that. There's nothing derogatory about your body being exposed. It's not a sexualization. You know, when you're living in an arid environment out here like Pipe Spring on the Arizona Strip, you want to keep your body as cool as possible. 
You know, and you can look back at other ancient cultures like the Egyptians that lived in a hot area as well, and they didn't wear much clothing either. But rarely do you hear them being referred to as dirty um, or over-sexualized. Oftentimes you'll hear, you know, social scientists refer to Egyptians as, you know, advanced civilization. They had beautiful objects that they wore, um, but never any comments on them and their lack of clothing. So to the colonists who had complete opposite views of clothing, they attribute this self-perception of native, native people as being infested with sexual sin. This increased the concept of native people being seen as less than human, soulless, often referenced being viewed as less than human, creates a comfortability of abuse or a rape. So if, you know, today we have modern descendants of your American introduction, and unfortunately some of these issues are still perpetuated almost like in an oral tradition down through your American descendants. And so sometimes you get people who think, you know, well, these women, they were abused and raped in the past, they're soulless, and it's their fault that they're living in this lifestyle, so it's okay for me to abuse them. That's a typical red flag for a sign of abuse. If somebody is making, um, you know, an excuse of what they're doing, that's a problem. So slide, please. Other terms used besides um, MMIW, you will see MMIWG, which is Missing Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. You will see MMIR, Missing, Indi Missing and Murdered Indigenous Relatives. And you will also see MMIP, Missing and Murdered Indigenous People. And that is because we're trying to keep all inclusive for everyone in our community to be represented that is affected by this issue. Slide, please. So like I mentioned earlier, Indigenous women are leading the charge. Throughout Native American communities, women are viewed as leaders, life givers, teachers, and essential components of a healthy tribal organization. Um, if you was to learn about some of the Southern Paiute governments, you will come to understand that many of our tribal councils are run by women. And most of the people that are voted into these positions to make up the collective council are all female, which is really, really great because we're able you know, to take charge and lead in issues that affect women in our community. So this is an initiative to create a space where tribal women can be mouthpieces for our communities and issues that we face. We are advocating to bring our sisters home and to push the issues that those we have lost are not forgotten. And we will not stop raising awareness until all come home or all cases are solved. So we refuse to give up the fight. Slide, please. So why red? A lot of people, you know, they get curious about that. Why is the color red connected to today or to, days, or to other days like Red Shawl Day? So red is a sacred color to the native community. It is one of the colors that stands for the four directions. Um, we believe this color is a color that our ancestors and those that have passed, off, passed on recognize from the spirit world. When we wear this color, we're calling them home. Um, so growing up traditionally, when my grandmother was teaching me the colors of the four directions, she had taught me that the color red stands for the direction of west, which is the direction of the spirit world. So as we pass away, our spirits move through that cardinal point to reach the happy hunting grounds. And so in our homes, I was taught as a child to make traditional tobacco ties, to hang on my west wall so that when my ancestors or current family members that pass away can see these red flags in my house and they can come and they can visit and rest for a minute before they make their complete transition. We often hang red corn alongside of the red tobacco ties. And that is because corn is also one of our sacred plants. It's the, you know, it's a giving life component Corn was created by indigenous people about 7,000 years ago in Mesoamerica, moved up through the Southwest. Um, so, you know, we believe that they'll come and they'll smell the corn. You know, they can't physically eat it, but they enjoy the smell. It reminds them of their life. So slide, please. <laughs> what are the facts? So, you know, some of these facts are gonna be, you know, they might make you feel a little bit uncomfortable, but in comparison, or excuse me, in comparison to other women, such as the Gabby Petito case, 710 Indigenous people, mostly girls, received no coverage or news reports on these cases. In Wyoming, where Gabby's remains were found, there was little to no coverage for Indigenous people, um, you know, which unfortunately is very disheartening for members of our community because for years, you know, there have been many cases, especially in Wyoming, of women passing away and being murdered but you didn't see this big, huge uh, news push or publicity push like we did with Gabby's case. 
And I don't want to take away the fact that her case was, you know, very debilitating and, and traumatic for her family and very sad. Of course it was. Nobody should have to lose their life in that way. But all I'm trying to say is that in comparison, you don't see Indigenous women on newspapers. You don't see them on the New York Times. You don't see them on CNN. Why? That is a question that we need to answer. Um, and Native people fall into victim blaming from those outside of our community. Again, those stereotypical phrases get imposed upon us. Um, and it's always, you know, that we deserve this. It's, you know, what we've imposed upon ourselves. And murder is the third leading cause of death for Native women under the age of 35. A lot of young women are being victims of this. Um, you know, and those young women, we have a saying within our communities. Anything that we do today, we do it with a conscious mind to prepare for the seven generations ahead of us. If we are losing our young women, our life givers, and those that are going to give life to the future generations, how is our cultural knowledge going to pass on? How is our songs going to move? How are our dances going to move? How is all of this going to get continued on if we're losing our young women? So as Native women, we're actually raised to be hyper aware of our surroundings. Um, this can at times cause a normality of the issue within our own community. I myself, I was raised by two women. I was raised by my mom and grandma, and I can remember being a little girl growing up. I grew up in Salt Lake City in the inner city and consistently always being told, don't get into cars with nothing but boys. Don't hang out with nothing but boys. Be conscious of where you're walking. Don't be alone with grown men. You know, we shouldn't have to be telling our young women within our community these things. They should feel comfortable to hang out or be in any in, uh, environment that they choose to be. So unfortunately, because we're raised with this hyper awareness, when we become adults and we start to go around, um, and like I mentioned the statistics earlier about women um, already experiencing abuse as children, we think it's normal. You know, this is consistently happening to us. It's happened to my mom, it's happened to my grandma, it's happened to my aunt and my cousin. So it's okay. This is just something that comes along with being a native woman. We shouldn't have to feel that way. No woman should. Um, and we need outside allies and advocates to join our fight. We need people like you guys today to come and listen, to educate yourself, to learn about the issue, to help spread awareness, to help be advocates for people um, in areas that we're not able to get our voices heard. And the state of Utah, which is very close to us, we're right on the border, ranks as eighth in the nation, with the highest cases. Eighth. Uh, Salt Lake City, I think, is in the top five cities in the country with the most amount of missing, murdered Indigenous women. Um, lots of my relatives leaving the reservation, entering in the Salt Lake Valley, um, you know, have been shot in the head, left on the side of the freeway, um, beaten up, left in motels. So Utah, you know, this is a cry out to you. Let's do better. Let's figure out how we can change this. Slide, please. So how does Pipe Spring raise awareness? Um, so we have tribal interns like Miss Winona Tongates, who shows support through her art. Winona is not here today. She's currently in Santa Fe attending the American Indian Art Institution University. This is a piece of her art that she drew here. Um, we've, all, we've also had other IIC interns that have worked here at Pipe Spring that are non-Indigenous that have helped join the fight. Um, we've had earring displays. You know, sometimes us as women, we lose one of our earrings. And so there was a big push for a while to, to create a display back in D.C. of a large panel of one-sided earrings to help represent these women. And so one of our interns, she gracefully did that. Um, and our rangers are dedicated to the policy from Secretary Holland. You know, and that's one thing that's really great here at Pipe Spring is that, yeah, we're a small monument, but because we're small, we're able to elevate our voices in other ways that bigger parks don't have the time or maybe the capacity to do so. Um, and we are creating a space for cultural diversity and awareness for all. That, again, like I said, is the beauty of Pipe Spring. We have the history of two completely different cultures here, but even though we're different, we can join forces together and we can educate and teach people outside of our communities about who we are. Slide, please. So how can you help? Um, you can use your voice. You can share pictures, share stories, videos, news articles to keep the movement going. We need help from everyone to raise awareness. Um, support with no shame. We must all remember no one's um, life means more than the other. No culture means more than the other. Nobody's race means more than the other. We are all valuable. We are all human. Um, so just keep that in mind also. 
report suspicious activities when visiting public lands to local law enforcement. You know, unfortunately, when you really get into the weeds of doing research about these cases, some of them happen very close to boundaries of public lands. Um, so definitely, if you see somebody that's a little shady, reach out to a ranger in a visitor center, you know, kind of tell them. And even if you feel like you're not safe, talk to a ranger, tell them I'm not feeling safe. Can some or safe? Can somebody walk me to my car? Um, wear a red shawl or red clothing the day in the week of Red Shawl Day. The National Park Service will start posting stuff close to Red Shawl Day so people can start to get their antennas up about when this day is happening. Um, visit a local national park. Go see the rangers, you know, that are supporting this fight. Um, ask them questions and learn about the issue. And join the conversation on social media using the hashtag, hashtag here. So hashtag Red Shawl Day, um, hashtag MPS Indigenous. Hashtag MMIW, hashtag MMIP, and post a, li a list of women missing from your community. Start doing research in your local community, county, town, or city. Um, you know, and they necessarily don't even need to be indigenous women. You know, women go missing all the time. Let's help raise awareness about the problems with human trafficking. Slide, please. When is Red Child Day? Red Shawl Day is November. It's November. It's November. It's yeah, it's during Native American Heritage Month. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yep. So I want to share a couple of slides about some individuals from my family and community that are still missing or have been murdered. Um, this here is my aunt. <laughs> um, her name, well, her given name, his given name is Cornell Burns. She was a drag queen. She helped my mom raise me. My mom was a teen mom. Um, so he, she is Northern Ute. She's from the Two-Spirited community, um, and she was murdered. She was shot in the back of the head, pushed out of a car in Salt Lake City in a really strong uh, winter storm. And how she was found is a gentleman was backing out of his driveway to go to church on Sunday morning, and he's seen a piece of her neon pink coat sticking out of the snow. So he went over, and he's seen this big snow berm, and he uncovered it, and there laid my aunt. And so he immediately reported it to the authorities. Still to this day, in 2023, um, you know, her case has went cold. There has been nobody identified as the suspect in murdering her. So the date of the crime was, you know, May 18th, 1990. If you know anything about this case, or if you recognize seeing my aunt around in the Salt Lake City Valley during that time, please contact the Salt Lake City Police. Um, the phone number is here, 801-799-3000 with any leads. Slide, please. This here is my old babysitter. <laughs> Her name is Akosita Kafusi. She is Polynesian and Northern Ute. Um, she is also a victim of murder, and her case was quite recent. Her body was found near the Saltaire in Magna, Utah. It is still a cold case unsolved. Um, so she was also unfortunately shot, left on the side of the freeway. So anyone with information that has a lead, please contact the unit or Unified Police Department's Violent Crimes Unit at 385-468-9800 or dispatch at 801-743-7000. Slide. This right here is a young Southern Paiute man. He's been missing since 2011. Toby Tweedy Baker. His description is he's five feet, eight inches tall, weighs about 260 pounds. He has black hair and brown eyes. Please contact the Washington County Sheriff's Office at 435-656-6500 in reference to case number 1109003. Toby was last seen at the Motel 6 in St. George, Utah. So if you remember seeing him or have any leads, please follow up. I'm sure his family would love to have, you know, that part and that chapter closed for them. Slide, please. So I'd like to take a moment of silence for those that we have lost um, and those who have not been found yet and that we can bring them home. So we'll just take a pause and take a moment of silence. Thank you. Thank you in our language and thank you for coming and listening today. I hope you really learned something important and was able to educate yourself and take something back to your community or to your agency that you are visiting from. So have a great day. I'll be right here for questions. 
And then we have um, some little red shawl pins. But before we tie up, um, Superintendent McCutcheon is going to come up and she's going to just do a thank you. And she also has another little thing to share with you guys. Thank you. topic to present on or discuss and to bring awareness to. It takes a lot of emotional strength um, and ability to be an advocate for our people and um, and for women. And so uh, really powerful and we appreciate that Autumn does this for us. And also I thank you to you all for coming. This is um, a really important matter that's happening in our country that I would say a huge portion of the United States population has no idea is happening. Um, there are a number of podcasts out right now. There are um, in, in awareness is coming, but the more and more you can do for folks around your community and to recognize that, um, that this is happening, that there is still um, that. Unfortunately, a lot of our law enforcement um, is still struggling because of capacity and resources to really pay attention to this problem, and it still continues. And so the awareness is really important. So thank you all for that. Um, also, we do have our park supporter here, Zion Forever Project, um, does support uh, Pipe Spring National Monument, Zion, and Cedar Breaks, um, and for participating in the event today and showing your support for murdering, murdered, missing, and indigenous women, children, and relatives, and people. Um, we do have a 10% uh, discount for coming to support the effort and coming to Pipe Spring. So uh, we'll pass those around to folks today. But again, just another huge thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Autumn. Thanks, Autumn. Press pin, and that's just for you to pin on your clothing today to help raise awareness about today and the importance. Um, and you might visit some places and see red dresses hanging out. That's also just calling these women home that have went missing and murdered. So if you want one, they're just right up here. Do the different okay. chapters of, of the reservations. What was that? Do the different chapters on the red list of, um, of the missing people that I heard you say that it was important to keep the names alive. Yeah, yeah. So um, Navajo Nation is the one that has chapters. Um, Southern Pines, we have bands. Um, and then, you know, you might have like mesas, the Hopi Jerome mesas, there's pueblos, villages. Um, but yes, tribes definitely would be keeping a list of individuals who are affected by this issue. And you could probably um, even look it up on a database with the FBI. Yeah. I have a question about that, the database because I heard that <clears throat> maybe it's only recently that the government started keeping track. Right. Until it then, is. it was a tribal question. That's absolutely true. Yeah. There, previously, in the early years, there was no database. Um, and that was one of the issues that a lot of the women in our community really started fighting and pushing back to legislators to get bills passed. In saying that, you know, there are large databases for other women outside of our community. Why are we not putting out any information about these indigenous women? Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you guys. I know it's a heavy topic and it, it is a lot to take in. And yeah, it does take a lot of emotional strength. Every time I see my you know, Ant's face on there, my baby setters, I just want to start crying, but you know, their voice needs to be heard and you have to do it in a strong way rather than being like a puddle of tears. So, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. You are welcome. Yeah, thank you guys online. <laughs> you have many thank yous here. Right. <laughs> Recording. Yes, so uh, we will take the recording, uh, audio transcribe it to do all the captioning and everything. Uh, we're going to post it on our YouTube channel and I'll share that link beyond that. Stop recording, maybe. Ta-da!